Yeah. Okay. So, hi everyone and very, very welcome ministers, government representatives and representatives from both the Swedish and the Brazilian innovation system. The co-creation date is a Vinova event in collaboration with the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation in Sweden and the Swedish Embassy in Brazil. Uh, my name is Regina Sommer and I am responsible for our bilateral collaboration with Brazil at the Swedish agency uh, Vinova. We are very, very happy to have representatives from a broad spectrum from both our innovation systems today. Today, both government, academia, industry and public organizations take part in different uh, panel discussions that we will have during the day, focusing on the four prioritized areas, smart cities, health, bioeconomy and mining. We believe that developing common action plans uh, that we have been doing during, been doing during this year is the, the, the right way forward. And uh, this is also part of these days to have a dialogue based on the action plans and see where we can head uh, together in the future. Thank you very much for joining us and taking part of the, these uh, exciting new way forward. Uh, and uh, please visit the webpage that we have for the Sweden Brazil uh, collaboration that is called sbii.org. Uh, or you can join our LinkedIn group, Sweden Brazil Innovation Initiative, where we uh, are offering it's a platform for you to communicate between uh, organizations uh, and actors in Sweden and Brazil, but also for us funding agencies to be able to. Um, get your feedback and also in, inform you about interesting new calls. Uh, any questions today, you can write them in the Q&A. Uh, so it's like a chat function that you have here in Zoom. And I will read them to the, the speakers. Now I would like to present the Swedish Minister of Business, Industry and Innovation, Mr. Ibrahim Bailan and then the Brazilian Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation, Mr. Marcos Pontes. Dear participants, my name is Ibrahim Bailan. I'm the Minister for Business, Industry and Innovation of Sweden. Let me begin by expressing my great appreciation of Sweden's and Brazil's ongoing cooperation in science, technology and innovation. The cooperation between Sweden and Brazil has intens intensified in recent years. One important accomplish accomplishment has been to set up working groups on four focus areas, bioeconomy, smart cities, life science and sustainable mining. These are relevant and important areas to Sweden. We highly appreciate the, the, the founding of these groups as well as the, as the establishment of the group for funding agencies. Now, we are also pleased to conclude that with joint efforts, we now have action plans in place for all four areas. The strategic work that has been done makes a good foundation for further deepening our collaboration. Now looking forward, many of the societal challenges that we face today, they are complex. They are cross-sectoral and they are global. An isolated issue cannot be resolved without considering the associated consequences. Therefore, we want to raise the importance of system innovation and to have a more mission-oriented approach. We need to innovate how we innovate, also in our bilateral collaborations. Sweden and Vinova wants to open up for innovation that makes a difference and focuses on the sustainable development goals. This is also the rationale between Vinova's co-creation days for innovation that you are now attending. I very much look forward to continuing following the development of this work and hope that this week's event will contribute to an even deeper collaboration between our countries and actions toward a more sustainable future. Dear friends, thank you very much for listening and I wish you all the best for a successful event. Thank you.
Good morning, and uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this opening of this very important event, uh, talking about mission-oriented. And uh, also with my friends from uh, Sweden, we know uh, about the cooperation between Brazil and Sweden have been a very important cooperation. And we just, I just saw the, the gripping flying here in Brazil. And I confess that I, I was jealous. I was thinking about flying there. And uh, about this, this event today, what I see, the first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate all the uh, organizers, especially uh, our uh, keynote speakers, Professor Caetano Pena and uh, Mr. Joaquin Appelquist. Uh, and thank you very much for bringing your knowledge into this, this webinar. I also like to salute uh, Mr. Ibrahim Bailen, the Minister of uh, Enterprise and Innovation. And from here, from our side uh, in Brazil, in this Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, uh, this is exactly what we have, we've been doing since last year, uh, trying to uh, point, to focus all our efforts <coughs> in results that we can bring to the society. So. Uh, of course, all the basic science, they are very important and we have a mission here in this ministry of producing uh, knowledge, producing uh, uh, wealth to, for the country and also uh, helping with the quality of life of the population. So when you think about the, uh, the work of a ministry like this, uh, we have to think about the base knowledge that we bring through um, the basic sciences. also. We have to use this knowledge to transform uh, all these uh, uh, studies and all the, the, the papers that we have, scientific papers, in a new, uh, let's say, new products, new services, innovations uh, that can solve problems. For example, now we have the COVID. Of course, a very difficult moment for everybody. And, um, but also, you can think about this moment like an opportunity for those uh, that can bring solutions and can transform those solutions in new companies, uh, startups, and, and so on. So we've been working uh, towards uh, mission-oriented here. Uh, we have a set of priorities that we established in this ministry last year. And everything that we do here uh, goes towards those priorities. It's like the, the tip of an iceberg. So we have all the basic science, uh, the base of the, 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 the iceberg, and all the, uh, the priorities in terms of technologies to be developed in the tip of the, the iceberg. When I say this, I'm talking about uh, aerospace, nuclear, uh, cybersecurity, I'm talking about uh, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and several different areas that we are working here in Brazil, and I'm sure that working together with Sweden, we've been, uh, we, we are going to be uh, much more su successful. And of course, uh, bringing the, the mission that we have here in this ministry, producing knowledge, producing wealth to the country and helping with the quality of life will be uh, fulfilled no, not only for the Brazilians, but also for the Swedish people. And you can count on the ministry and you can count on me here. Thank you very much. Good morning. Great. These co-creation days are about finding common missions to together reach the sustainable development goals. How can we work more strategic? How can we work more effective together and focus on common missions? But first, we need to understand how Brazil and Sweden are mobilizing towards a mission-oriented approach. We want this to be the start of a new way of collaborating on an international level between two innovative countries. Each track uh, consists of representatives from our joint subgroups within bioeconomy, smart city, health and sustainable mining. mining. They will give us a presentation on different national perspectives and initiatives followed by a discussion on possible areas of future collaboration. We now present two national experts 
on mission related research and innovation. First to speak is Joachim Appelquist, Deputy Director General from Vinova, followed by Professor Caetano Pena, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. After the presentation, there will be given an opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Joachim, you are on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm especially happy to be here with uh, Professor Pena, who is, I mean, leading the, the, the academic work and really have, having us all, uh, policy makers included, under, uh, included, understand more of this um, mission approach the need for transformation and also the uh, the need to have a more systemic approach when it comes to innovation policy. Uh, I will just start by sharing my slides and um, and uh, tell you tell you something about the work that we are doing at uh, at Vinova, which is Sweden's innovation agency. Um, so as Minister Pontus mentioned in his introduction, innovation is more important than ever. Uh, the, the COVID crisis has really shown us the need for the, the need to work together, especially in order to solve uh, major societal challenges. Uh, climate, the climate crisis is of course a slow, slow moving crisis aging uh, population in a number of countries is another, uh, but then we have also been shaken by, by the very short term crisis or, or very immediate crisis that, that uh, uh, the COVID-19 situation is right now. And what we have learned during this, uh, during this time, both working with the, with the uh, climate challenge and, uh, but also the, the corona situation, is that we need in order to, to provide solutions and move uh, and, and implement the solutions that are being de developed, uh, we need to broaden uh, our view of who should be included into the innovation system and into the innovation processes. Uh, so this is very important. It's, it cannot longer be done in, in labs or in academia. We need to have a more transparent and open innovation process in order for us to deliver on the sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals. Um, Vinova's role in this is really to, to facilitate, to make things happen a lot in a national context, but also in an international sense where we have been working for over 10 years together with uh, Brazilian counterparts in de developing Swedish-Brazilian innovation collaboration. So, so we, we are really about laying the ground for innovation that makes a difference. And our vision is to, to co contribute to making Sweden a force for innovation in a sustainable uh, world. And we do that through identifying uh, uh, strength, weaknesses in the, in the Swedish uh, innovation system, working a lot with analysis and mapping, but also mobilizing the necessary stakeholders and organizations that are needed to be included in this innovation process. And then um, the bottom line is that we also, we, we're also a funding agency. We provide uh, around 300 million euros uh, in funding uh, to share risks with different stakeholders in the Swedish innovation system every, every year. So funding uh, different types of innovation processes all around uh, Sweden, but also international collaboration. That's the role of, of Vinova. And as uh, Minister Bailan mentioned in his uh, introduction, um, if we're going to solve the challenges that I mentioned in, in, in my introduction, we need to uh, think differently. Uh, uh, we keep, I think many of us in this room can be, um, it's, 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 it's a kind of a paradox uh, that we all can identify the new challenges that we are facing, but still we often try to address them using the ideas of last century and, 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 and like uh, Madame All, Madeleine Albright, the former US State Secretary, formulated all, already back in 2013, really looking quite long back in order to find, find the tools and paradoxically then expecting a different outcome. So 
we really must innovate uh, how we innovate, innovate. It seems like we have the talking points from the Swedish side here, but because I think uh, Bailen used uh, the, the same phrase, but I think this is really key for us that are in this uh, innovation, in, in these innovation systems, trying to de develop new solutions. We need to think differently. And this is of course based not just um, through policy experiences or talking to companies and academics and others that are doing the work. It's also well-funded in, in, in the academic literature. And I guess Professor Penna will come back to that in his presentation as well. But I think we really see this shift towards a more systemic approach, transformative approach, mission-oriented approach, whatever um, uh, terminology that you would like to use as, as, a, as, an, as a next generation of innovation uh, policy and a next generation in the understanding of what is needed in order to uh, continue to have a uh, innovative development in, in, in societies around the world. Um, we have been work, we were working with many different um, uh, academics around the world in order to inspire us to uh, uh, try new, try new ways of, of uh, uh, carrying out the innovation policy in Sweden. Uh, we have been working, for instance, with Mariana Mazzucato, uh, who is working a lot with a mission-oriented approach. She's part of an international adv advisory board that we have, that we have set up, uh, advising uh, Vinova's work. But we're also working a lot with Prof Professor Penna and his colleagues in the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium, the TIPSI uh, project. So we're trying to pick up the, the ideas everywhere because I think we're, we're definitely on a learning journey uh, all together. So we need to try out uh, new things together. And so when we have gotten this understanding of where we're trying to move, we, we have really tried, since we're, we're a policy agency, not the think tank, we are really trying to make it happen in real life. So we have tried out this, been, been inspired by these min, min, mission-oriented innovation processes and have tried to carry, out, carry them out in, in, in practice. So we have done a couple of pilot projects where we have brought together um, different stakeholders that are necessary in order to set the right missions, set up the right ambitious uh, goals, both in the sphere of um, mobility, future of mobility, um, and also uh, future sustainable food system, which we which we know is a, is a very uh, which is a huge source of um, carbon emission, at least in the Swedish uh, context. So we, we set up one project focusing on school food, which is free in Sweden. So this is one area where you can really influence the way food is produced, the way it's consumed, the way it's understood in order to have it help to lower the carbon emission and also benefiting the uh, strength and the health of, of uh, kids in Sweden. And as you can see, we really tried to do this thing that has been said in the literature, trying to bring together different types of, of individuals representing different types of organizations. So in the school food uh, um, project, we have every, every people all ranging from a high school student to a farmer being in, being taking part in these workshops that we had in that really scope the work that we're gonna do forward and, and in identifying the right missions. And when doing this work, we also came, come, came to think that we, we've done this before, uh, said, having these kind of mission approaches, um, uh, but perhaps we used, uh, and we know it, we, we used a different uh, terminology back then. But we we did uh, we, we had a project uh, starting in, in the mid '90s, where the Swedish government set up a very ambitious goal of having zero death and zero seriously injured in traffic. And then, based on that goal, a lot of policy initiatives was implemented in the Swedish system. So that is one one historical example. And work taking this mission-oriented approach, one thing that has really struck us when, when working with it at Vinova is that we really, we have needed to rethink the way we approach projects and setting up programs, what, can, what we should fund in, in, in the future. And, and here, I think it's a way of moving away from a 
a mindset where innovation was, was a lot about really framing things, uh, finding your specific target group, finding the key problem, rather than now moving more to a really embracing complexity. If it was reducing complexity, finding the targets group, finding the right niches to work with, now it's much more how can we embrace the complexities that we need, that we know we need to address in order to go from an idea into implementation. So these are just examples that you can see on the slides on the different perspectives that we need to address in order to, for instance, to address the corona crisis, address the climate change crisis, implementing autonomous vehicle into say the, you name the example. Um, so, so this is the systems perspective has been very important for us going forward when, when we design uh, the, the projects and, and the programs. Uh, so just to, I will just leave you with, with, a, with a couple of examples. Um, one thing that we're trying to initiate, initiate now in, in, in a number of different areas, what we call systems demonstrators. It sounds a bit bureaucratic, but it's really going back to the, the insights that I was talking about, the importance of the systems perspective is really to design projects where you have a number of different uh, perspectives and aspects of a problem being included into a project. So this is one example where uh, Volvo Trucks is leading a, a, a um, project uh, where you try to build an autonomous logistic chain taking uh, cars from the Volvo car manufacturer from the, from the um, um, uh, plant to the uh, harbor where they are being shipped all around uh, the globe. Uh, and this, this is, of course, a lot of technical issues designing these uh, new autonomous technologies, but there are also a lot of regu regulatory issues because half of the road traveled from this plant into to the harbor is done on public roads. So you can just imagine the number of changes that are needed in order to make it legal and having the right legal framework for autonomous trucks to be to be driving in the streets. So this is one example. Another example is where we try to really open up the innovation processes and create cri critical mass of different type of stakeholders working together on, on a common problem. This is one example. It's a, a network set up in Sweden uh, two years ago. It's called AI Innovation of Sweden. Uh, or now I think it's changing to AI Sweden. Well. Um, it's, it's really a network of 100 plus organization, strong focus on private sector actors, where they are trying to, where they are working together in order to strengthen Sweden's position in this race for AI leadership around the world. And, and this is really a bit, one key thing that they were trying to do in this, in this network is really to pool data resources and, and data sets in order to train algorithms uh, faster. And as you can imagine, a lot of things is connected with that. How do you solve IP? How do you solve integrity issues, et cetera, especially if you're working competitors in, in, in the same project. So this is very exciting. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an example of these, how we create these open arenas where you can collaborate. And this is also open to international partners. There are um, quite a few of them have joined already. And then I mentioned a couple of times the importance of the regulatory framework. And this is something that we've been working on at Vinova over the last three years is really to how can we stimulate regulatory agencies in Sweden to really understand and take on a role where they really support the development, development on new initiatives rather than being included too late into the development processes and, and sometimes serves as an anchor rather than something that rather than an organization that can really help innovations coming from idea into implementation so these this is a work that we do uh, where we bring together the different stakeholders in in an area where where there are regulatory challenges present or in the future and and have them work together in really identifying what is it needed in order to update the regulatory framework so that it enables uh, the in innovations to be implemented on, on, in, on scale. Um, 
So this is another example. And then finally, I mean, being in this uh, workshop where we are, are addressing the collaboration between Sweden and Brazil, I think one thing that we have worked that much with so far when it comes to the systems perspective is really to, to use the power of internationalization. Because I think the solutions that we are developing in many of the areas are not specific to us, are not like country specific. So I think we could really benefit uh, uh, from bringing in international partners from the start in these systems demonstrators, be them in Sweden or in Brazil, uh, and, and really try thinking about creating like twin projects in other countries where you can try out different flavors of the solutions that are being developed, because that will really help to strengthen the competitiveness of the partners that are involved in both countries. But it will also help us uh, speed up the process in, in, in implementing the different solutions, not in country by country, but have a more broad based implementation from the start. So thank you very much. Really looking forward to my fellow pres presenter and hear his perspective. And then I welcome questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joachim and uh, Kaitano. You're welcome to show your presentation. Thank you, uh, Joachim. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I salute all the participants and also our ministers. And thanks for this opportunity to represent Brazil and giving our perspective on mission-oriented uh, innovation policy. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen. Um, so I'm currently on leave of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, I'm, I'm carrying out my research at the Center for Global Studies at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, so as mentioned by Joachim, I'm collaborating uh, in the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium and uh, I'm trying to develop a, a mission-oriented approach that, uh, that tackles transformative missions. So today I'll talk about uh, the Brazilian experience and also uh, how the, the framing of this uh, type of policies is shifting from a technological missions to transformative missions. So I'll start with, with a bit of a background so that I can explain what I mean uh, by this shift and to show how Brazil has been uh, developing missions for, the, for many decades actually. So where does uh, mission-oriented policies come from? The, actually, or the new wave, where, where does it come from? And there is this metaphor from the 70s where uh, the evolutionary economist uh, Richard Nelson asked, well, if we can land on the moon, why can't we solve the problems of the ghetto in, in the sense that why can't we solve uh, social problems? And regardless of his answer to this question, what uh, lies behind it is that is a view that science, technology, innovation can and should contribute to solving what we call societal challenges or societal problems. And in this view, science and innovation are not anymore end in themselves, but means to improve the welfare of the society. So the first, uh, or the origins of this comes from a report uh, from the United States called Science, the Endless Frontier that led to programs such as the uh, Manhattan Project to develop the, the atom bomb or the Apollo uh, program that landed on the moon. And uh, we could define mission-oriented policies as systemic policies that use scientific knowledge to solve specific problems. But we can actually uh, differentiate between different generations or waves of these policies. Regardless of the type of policies being put in uh, landing on the moon or tackling uh, uh, climate change or car safety, uh, these missions, they require exploring and combining public and private capacities. Uh, neither the, the private sector nor the, the state can achieve those missions alone because of the complexity they, they, they entail. Um, so what are these three generations of mission-oriented policy? The first generation identified by the literature is the type of systemic industrial catching up. Uh, when the US and Germany were catching up developing countries, they uh, implemented such type of missions. Later, they were emulated by Latin American countries and Asian countries with more success. The second one are the ones that we always have in mind, the technological frontier missions. Uh, 
mainly the US projects in the 20th century in the defense, aerospace, and energy sectors. And thirdly, is the new wave of uh, mission-oriented policies tech, uh, aimed at solving major societal challenges like uh, climate change, environmental problems, demographic issues, nutrition, so on and so forth. And we could say that the Sustainable Development Goals provide a broad uh, framework of a, 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 a broad list of these societal challenges to be tackled. Brazil has a long record of mission-oriented policies, broadly speaking, considering these three types. For instance, we have our import substitution policies of the 50s until the 70s. Um, and here it, it's important to bear in mind that it's very difficult to assign a mission to a specific category. Of course, for instance, Petrobras, we could say it was uh, initially catching up mission, but later it was uh, exploring uh, oil in ultra deep waters with the ProCap 1000, 2000, 3000 programs, and it was a more technological frontier missions. Then we have the development of Brazilian aviation, the nuclear program that led to the uh, partnerships with Germany to develop a, a nuclear submarine and also um, uh, uh, power plants. Then we had the development of tropical agriculture by Embrapa, and nowadays the, the big project uh, Sirius, a secretron light source um, particle accelerator. And we could even say that Brazil has some uh, experience with solving major societal challenges, like energy security with Proalco in the 70s and 80s, developing the ethanol uh, industry for fueling cars, or the state uh, policy from, the, from when uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology of Brazil was still a secretariat uh, and, uh, and beginning in the 80s to tackle the issue of health and life sciences. So these are all, we could frame it broadly as missions and they are still to be studied from this perspective. So I think that Brazil has a lot to, to learn and, to, uh, and lots of lessons to offer to, uh, to, the, to the area of mission-oriented policies. The question is, what's new about this third generation? Well, the first thing is that uh, the most important thing is that contrary to the technological missions, they, uh, uh, what we want is a transition from uh, an economic system to another, from a technological system to another. Our, there is already a system in place. So it's not anymore about technological feasibility but it's about economic feasibility as well. We don't want to show that solar energy is technically vi uh, viable. We want it to substitute current fossil fuels. So this entails a uh, much more complexity and then requires the participations of broader society and stakeholders in defining the missions and executing them. So there is a role for the state to lead the, the initiative, but it requires combining it with bottom-up experimentation because we want to solve problems uh, and sometimes incremental innovation, those that are not as radical as uh, rocket science, they will also have a, a contribution to make, opening up the space for many types of actors, many types of enterprises, and, and not just those that have technical competence. And finally, uh, the diffusion of results is a central goal. So the, the fact that we are right now using technologies that were initially developed uh, in the space race um, doesn't mean that during the, the Apollo program, uh, having the diffusion of these results in the civil society was a goal. It was actually a, a spillover. Uh, and it, although it was encouraged, it was not, not central. Right now, we really want that this technologies diffuse and they are adopted and they are massively adopted to substitute what's old. So this requires combining many types of policy instruments, including those to destabilize an existing industry and to accommodate those that will end up losing from this transition. So the new missions are about systemic socio-technical transformation. However, we still don't have a clear framework for this type of transformative missions. This is what we've been trying to develop in the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium, uh, of which Vinova is, is a, a key partner. So Transformative Innovation Policy is a new way of doing uh, STI policies, and, and it seeks a global reach combining knowledge that is dispersed across the globe. And actually it has a, a, a strong focus on how to meet the SDGs. So if you are interested, I invite you to visit our website. So against this, uh, this uh, background, I will now talk a bit more of ongoing uh, 
mission-oriented policy initiative that we've been developing in Brazil. It's actually a project that's commissioned by the Ministry of Science and Technology and executed through the Center for Strategic Studies, uh, CGE. It is in the area of bioeconomy, and we are right now. It's probably going to have. We will have the final reports now in December. The name of the project is ODBio, is uh, Bioeconomy Opportunities and Challenges. We are preparing a strategic roadmap for mission-oriented projects aiming at developing the Brazilian economy. It combines both uh, technological missions, but more importantly, out this type of transformative missions, transforming the economy from an unsustainable uh, fossil fuel-based economy towards renewable and circular economies. It, we've been adopting this methodology that I've been advancing in the past couple of years, and I, I just uh, introduce it very briefly. We start with the grand challenge, for instance, uh, how to develop bioeconomy in Brazil. From that, through framing process, we, tr we establish the missions. What are these framing processes? Are the different ways we can say we can solve that challenge? So to give an example that uh, Joaquin mentioned of car safety and street safety, one frame would be that we need to educate drivers. And for that, we would develop missions that would help drivers avoid accidents. The other frame is that we need people to survive when there is a crash. And in that frame, the mission would be to create safer cars. So this framing process is really key. And it uh, incorporates elements of design thinking that I know that uh, Vinova adopts in their mission approach. Um, we then, this is the novel part of this framework. We do a capacity evaluation. We don't assume that in Brazil, we have capacity to do everything. We actually try to assess what is needed to achieve the missions and what we have. And if we don't have then part of the projects that will be promoted will be to develop those capacities. So we differentiate between six types of capacities. On the left-hand side is the public sector capacity. So state capacity, technical administrative capacity and policy capacity, which includes the tools like procurement, but also R&D uh, subsidies, for instance. And on the uh, right-hand side is mostly the public, uh, the private sector capacity, the science and technology capacity, the productive capacity, and the consumer market capacity. The consumer market capacity is key for the transformative missions. We need not only to fund the development of science and technology, but also to promote the diffusion of these technologies. And for that, maybe subsidies or governmental procurement will be a very important tool. And, and based on this analysis, on this capacity evaluation, we define a, a portfolio of projects. So right now we are in the, in, uh, defining the areas and the, the missions for, for the ODBO project. Uh, initially, we identified three, three areas, three key areas, the development of biorefineries, the bio, uh, promoting different value chains to add value to products from the Brazilian biomes, from the Amazon through the Caatinga uh, and the other six, uh, well, we have six biomes plus the maritime biome. The third area is circular economy, but in a, in a more participative um, approach, we are promoting workshops also to hear from the private sector and other stakeholders, what would be the areas they, they find relevant to execute this mission. So the, the, it's important to bear in mind that while we have capacity to develop certain projects in these areas, we will need to combine knowledge. And here is where I see opportunities for international collaboration with Sweden, for instance, in this area. So uh, identifying what capacities we lack and then what are the capacities that Sweden has will be very interesting for executing certain projects. And so to finalize the takeaway from, from my presentation, we have a new generation of mission-oriented policies. These new generations are about transformative innovation, systemic transformative innovation, which can be framed in several ways. And the SDGs is a menu uh, of, of challenges to be addressed. Brazil has a vast experience in implementing different types of mission-oriented policies. So we have lots of lessons to learn and is still in look for studies. This is a call for my fellow academics to study Brazil from the mission-oriented perspective. We have an ongoing project uh, in bioeconomy, which we, uh, is adopting this uh, capacity-based framework to missions. Uh, and in this capacity-based framework, we don't assume we have all the capacity, but actually we try to, to develop the capacity needed. And here there is a space for collaboration. Transformative missions will require the comp combination of capacities 
no single actor, be it public or private, will have the, the, all the capacities to address these uh, challenges, to, uh, to promote and address the sustainable development goals. And, and therefore, we have a lot of space for international collaboration and experimentation. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm keen to take on the uh, questions and to discuss further insights with Joaquin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both presenters, for very, very interesting presentations. And now we open up for questions here. Jacob. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I would like to first to um, introduce um, Mr. Bernardo Milano from the Minister of uh, Science and Technology. He is the head of office for the International Affairs for the <clears throat> and then also say hi, hello to um, Anna Carlson from the Minister of Enterprise and Innovation. She is the coordinator for the bilateral cooperation with Brazil. And uh, both uh, Bernardo and uh, Anna have played a very, uh, very important role in our bilateral cooperation in uh, organizing with the bilateral uh, uh, action plan, which we had uh, carried out now. And uh, <clears throat> I will invite them to start, uh, start this session for questions to, to, to the panel. And uh, I would ask uh, Bernardo first, uh, if you would like to, to, to ask some questions. Thank you. Okay, dear Jacob, thank you very much for this opportunity for promoting this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you, Anna Carlson, Regina, and especially to uh, professors Joaquin Apoquist and Caetano Pena, both of you that are you know, you just made enlightened presentations for us. And uh, well, this is something that we see here in Brazil as an important driver for the future of research and development. And uh, it, uh, we've been discussing, you know, uh, uh, exactly mission oriented actions. What should we do, you know, for the future for the Brazilian research and development and innovation, you know, be more driven by this concept and, and your presentations were just amazing fantastic and I would, I would love to have those here with me but uh, you know in, in some situations or actually I think it's always one of the main points that we have to discuss you know it's the funding of any actions that we start and uh, it's more of the practical uh, side of the thing and you know funding for mission oriented research uh, appears to be an indispensable factor. I understand like, you know, it's not possible to discuss this without having any kind of financial support for the actions that we have to develop for so. So for the, that this is really necessary for the success of national initiatives. Well, should the definition of priorities by government creating the challenges be accompanied by investments only by the government itself, you know, the, the state itself, or do you see any way of, you know, convincing, bringing, bringing the private sector to invest jointly in the search of those solutions? You know, it's, it's very hard for us, you know, uh, the state only to be the only investor. So how can we be more, you know, appealing for the private sector? What are the arguments that you can bring to the table? to help us to address this issue. We should go first. Professor Pena, would you? Uh... First talking and then, I, and then I follow if you wish. Okay, well, uh, just from a, from a, like an innovation policy perspective then and, and being at an agency that has to make some of these decisions, um, of course, uh, with the directions from, from the ministry, but I think, I think you're really pinpointing a, a, a key issue here. And, and, and I think I have a different, some angles on it. I think, first of all, we really need to recognize like the, the academics have done that, I mean, working with these mission approaches and these transformative approaches is, is really about enabling transformative change. So there is definitely a role for the government, which is typically which is, I would say, perhaps more questionable if you're talking about funding single entity 
stakeholders, especially in the in the private sector. So here, I think it's a much more about funding ecosystems or funding like a development uh, where where I think there is there is a, a, a case to be made for for government uh, in some you can say subsidies or investments because I think it's about genuine risk that the private entities that are that are involved in these areas are taking on so there is uh, I would say a um, both an, uh, a theoretical and practical argument for having the, the government being involved. So, so having said that, and there I think it's about the maturity of the of the project. So in, in the start, we have done this in when we work with challenge driven approaches, etc. In the start, I think there is to have like creating feasibility studies, trying out possibilities, then you can have quite substantial funding from the government, but then the, the, the share of the, the public money should be uh, decreased uh, once you know that there is that these projects are, are, are getting traction. And then going back to the more theoretical approach, this this terminology about directionality, and I think Professor Penna can really add to this. I think this is really the, the difference between the, the old innovation system literature, at least in my mind, in, in my head. And, and the new ones. It's really about creating this directionality. And here, I think the government really has a role, setting long-term incentives, uh, creating perhaps public investment to show that this is for real. And then it was really interesting to, to just be refreshed about all the, the previous historical examples in, in Brazil with the move towards ethanol, for instance, where it's really about creating directionality for private investments to be in that area. I think we, we need to really learn from those historical examples going forward. So getting co-funding together with industry, uh, I think it's, it's very important, especially in the early stages, and then work to create directionality in order to have creating the incentives and, and, and the um, uh, more pr pr uh, predictive development for, for private investments. I would say those are important aspects. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bernardo, for the question. I think it's very important. And, um, and I think, as Joaquin mentioned, there is a, a strong case for public investment in R&D. Uh, I think even the most hardcore uh, economists agree that it's a market failure. And, uh, and market failure means that the private sector will not invest in R&D because it's very difficult to appropriate the, the, the profits from knowledge creation. That's why we have a patent uh, system, for instance. But uh, this, this is uh, uh, only one aspect because then you could say, well, the, the public sector should invest in producing new knowledge, investing in science, and then later on in the value uh, in the chain uh, of the innovation process, then the private sector should invest. But this is not really what happens um, in, in reality, even the United States. If you think the United States, it, it funded the key uh, uh, basic research for the hardware that we are using now to communicate, but it also gave the seed money for Apple, for Google and for others. So there is a space along the, the supply, uh, the innovation chain for the public sector to invest. So this is, I think it's a strong case, it's a peaceful case. But the, then the, there is the question, where should the, the, the private sector also contribute and how can we promote them? I think that there is also quite large evidence that for each dollar invested in, by the public sector in R&D, there is a multiplier effect where the, there is a spillover and the private sector also invests. And how to do that is the key. And as Joaquin said, giving directionality, pointing to where you want to be in the future, what's your vision for a certain sector, will help the, the private sector to do. I have a brief anecdote uh, from the Brazil. One challenge that we face as a developing country is how we, we can engage multinational corporations to invest in R&D in, in, in our country, because usually they do their, in their home country. And there was this uh, uh, competition for an R&D center of a very of a big multinational corporation in the area of computers. And we wanted it to install to have it installed here and the R&D for the for inter, uh, artificial intelligence in the area of health. And, and so the director, the Brazilian director was trying to push it for the for the for the company to, to install it here. And what the, the board of directors asked was what is the vision for the health system of Brazil for life science in Brazil, 
where does Brazil want to be in the future and how can we be really be sure that this is a state policy? And unfortunately, we didn't have an answer. And so it, we lost this R&D center. It was not installed here. That would be private sector uh, money being invested in developing mission-oriented innovation. In the end, we did have a, an R&D center that has been installed, but in the area of oil and gas, where we are very strong and we have a very big uh, a clear vision of what we want to do and develop in the future. So that shows that directionality is key to attract these private sector investments, I believe. Okay, thank you very much. That, that's an important issue we, we have to deal with every day on an, our everyday lives and it's, 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 it's good to hear from you so we can get to learn more and understand better. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Bernardo, for your thank you, Bernardo. questions. Very important. Uh, and I think I will now leave to Anna Carlson to see if you have a question also. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And thank you, Mr. Milanov, also for bringing up a great uh, question there and great answers and presentations. Um, for me, I thought it was very interesting that you lifted different examples in your presentations. I think that is very important to grasp this uh, concept. Uh, and also what Professor Pena mentioned about combining our countries' um, capacities. I see a lot of potential here, potential there. And um, that's why we're also so happy that we have this, uh, this action plan in place now uh, for bioeconomy, smart cities, mining and health. And my question to you is that from your point of view, do you see that any of these priority areas are sort of um, more uh, suitable for adopting this concept? Um, that you see that is there any any area that you uh, we could have more more success more easy any ideas on that would be would be interesting to hear thank you well i think uh, i think the the these areas are very promising uh, all over i think we where we have some initial work done that are very, uh, I would say, very promising. And, 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 and coming back to my last slide in my presentation, that has been done in, in, in a very in quite a national sense. I think it's about sustainable or underground mining. Uh, there has been a, a lot of work being done in, in Sweden with a, with a consortia of, of uh, Swedish companies that are have tried out solutions to have a connected mine that can where the, 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 the overall vision is really to have a, a mine where you don't need people on the ground, which uh, has a number of, of benefits, both in terms of environmental footprint, but also in terms of work uh, environment, et cetera. So I think this is, um, uh, this is one area where I think we can really try out the things that we have developed in, in, in the Swedish context where we are. And, and I know that there are discussion with Brazilian partners, so I think that would be a very interesting area. Then I think also in terms of bioeconomy, where, where I think with the Swedish stakeholders, I mean they're they're good, but we have a lot to learn. I mean we, you, you are really you're really global leaders in, in in this area from 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 Brazilian point of view. So really creating these. The, con the, the consortia around those in initiatives, having this, the, the organizations work in, in the bioeconomy sphere and find the areas where there are uh, mutual win-win situation. I think it's very promising. Uh, I've, been, I've, been, I've, been, I've been saying that for a couple of years now. So I hope now with the action plan and that it really takes off, that uh, the people get to know each other and that um, we will have some love in the air and, and get some product going. Yes, uh, thank you, Anna, for the question. I think, uh, first of all, I congratulate for the choice of areas. I find them all very good uh, from a Brazilian perspective and from a partnership perspective. And if I were to pick a, a single one, I would say, well, I, it would be difficult, but I would say health. Health is uh, probably quite obvious. If you look now with the pandemic, how uh, it is uh, uh, an area for mission-oriented policy. And I can say that one of the few areas where we've been consistently developing technolog uh, technological policy uh, through all governments since 1985 at least is in the health area. So because we have this big mission, which is to have a universal public and, and free 
health system for the Brazilian population. So we have this mission and then how or this challenge and how this challenge translates in mission is, a, is a also a, 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 an open area. But also I think for the future bioeconomy for Brazil, it's really a, a great area for developing a, a mission oriented approach. I think we have uh, lots of natural resources and this is where we could really benefit from leaping ahead you know, so if you, we want to advance, we can look to the future and not to the past, then bioeconomy would really be an area where Brazil could be the, a leader. So, and develop this with, with uh, Sweden would be very good. But these areas, they are all being developed uh, from a mission-oriented approach, as you mentioned in Sweden, in the case of mining, but Chile as well. We, we've developed a study of the Chilean case with the International uh, Inter-American Bank of Development in the area of mining. Medellin is also adopting this uh, methodology that I've developed in the area of smart cities. Valencia is also developing uh, smart cities. So they are great areas, so very, very good. Yeah, and that's a good. I mean, also the smart city area, uh, area of course, it's it's really it's it's a very it's 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 mission oriented in in its core, and and there has been a lot of ongoing work where we have really can make good connections between Sweden and Brazil through the work uh, headed by uh, Professor Silveria. I see she's on she's in in, in the. Uh, workshop right now. So uh, I think they, they have done an excellent work in really starting from a project level and, and there, there we really have a very good um, network to build upon if we if, when we take this further uh, into the area of smart cities. So Thank you for your comments and great ideas. It's uh, great to hear. Uh, I see that uh, we all have a uh, we can all agree that we see a lot of potential in these areas, so we all look forward to the to the work ahead. And uh, thank you for the invitation. And I hand uh, over back to you, Jacob. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I will first ask uh, Regina if uh, we have any questions from the audience. Not that many questions yet. Either okay. the presentations were extremely clear mm. and uh, okay. we now have a, a straight path ahead of us mm. uh, or people are a bit shy here in the beginning of our co-creation base. Okay, uh, we can, uh, I, but now it's a chance for people to send in some questions and in, in the meantime, I actually have a question uh, to the panelists about uh, our bilateral cooperation. As you said, you, you can see that we have a quite a good potential actually in, in all the areas. You mentioned all of them. I just wonder if, uh, if, uh, if this concept of, of um, mission oriented should work, does that mean that somebody has to take the lead May, in the government uh, agencies or is it the industry or do you have any recommendation recommendation for, for this? What, what does the experience say? Is it like everybody do their part or do we, do we need some Primus motor to drive the process. Thank you. I, th I think it's, it's, it's very different, actually. I think uh, what we have learned so far, especially working uh, when you're working it from, from a policy level, I think if you talk about the sustainable underground mining initiative, which had, had some mission element in them, we, we from, the, from the government, we took some initiatives from the start, funded a project, but then it really took off uh, by the private sectors, uh, private sector actors, the companies, they, they took it on and just started to run with it because there was a clear business case and they really, they, they, they really thought that this could, could work. Then you have others that are in, in some sense more complex or that where you rely really on heavily on things happening inside the government it could be regulatory it could be in terms of incentives and otherwise then you need to then you need to need to take it on in 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 a, in, in a bit different way and and i think i think to me at least it's, it's since these are very complex issues i think i really like the idea that you try to start something where you have like a national commitment it could not be you have not needed to come very far but then starting thinking about the international components very early 
so that you can really create these like twins in other in, in other countries that you can do similar developments uh, simultaneously. I think that could really be a way forward. But then I think you should really have a consortium doing things on either side. So and then that the other uh, that you then you can have some partners that could tag along. I think that would be that would be good because you really need these commitments. You re, you need these pioneers, these ones that are really seeing the light and doing the work. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank I you. have sorry. Yeah, just a brief comments that, that governance is really key. So there we there needs to be someone leading the process. Although we do need to have participation. I think that more important than who leads is that uh, this uh, leadership is, has the legitimacy both before the government and before society. It, it has to be, that's why um, we talk about uh, being a very uh, uh, thought provoking and challenging uh, mission. So what we see in mission oriented plans is that the Minister of Science and Technology sits next to the president who, who, and really gives him the legitimacy to carry it forward. And second, it needs to be alignment between the ministries. So there, the, the coherence between the finance minister and the science minister is really key here as well. Thank you very much. We have some questions now. Uh, and the first one is, how to incorporate both SMEs and big companies in the mission-oriented sense where the big actors are perhaps dominant? So Joachim first. Well, that might be a, a challenge. Um, so far, I think, especially with the changing innovation processes also inside the large multinationals where they to in, in quite rapid pace are relying much more on, on, on getting inputs and uh, talents and, and, and a lot of innovation work being ra rather in ecosystems or network. I think that they, for instance, in this in the case with the sustainable underground man, mining, there were quite a few SMEs that were part of the journey and that are now part of the solution that are being developed. So you, it's not, it's not very easy, but it's it's happening. And I think for us, as a as, as a as a funder, we can really keep an eye on that and really making sure that these are these consortia are include are including SMEs and are really open to to have them come on board. So I think that's that's uh, uh, we see it happen, but we need to track it. Well, I Mr. think Pena, that. Uh, we all know that innovation is increasingly agile. It requires agility. And SMEs, they have more agility than big corporations. And in order to involve them, it's better to have small contracts, small procurement contracts for small uh, enterprises than big contracts, which take time to, to implement and execute. And by the time they are ready, probably the innovation plan is already obsolete. So small procurement contracts, I think, is the best way to, especially at the city level, is the best way to involve SMEs in mission-oriented uh, policies. Another question here. Thank you very much. Uh, citizens' uh, engagement seems to be a success factor for mission-oriented policies and for transformation of systems. At which stage of the mission-oriented RNI initiative citizens should be engaged? in the design or in the implementation of the mission and why you think that way. So Mr. Pena, please, first. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think uh, if we are talking about these uh, societal challenges, involvement of citizens and of multiple stakeholders is key, both from the design phase and the implementation phase. I think that it's, it's in both. We need to that the mission is uh, perceived as legitimate, that uh, we see an urgency of tackling this mission. And by involving citizens from the first uh, stage onwards, we may be able to, to promote this uh, legitimacy. You, you may recall watching the movie called uh, The First Man about landing on the moon, that when the, there was started to have questioning about the legitimacy of the moonshot mission. That's when we stopped to see the development of the space race. When they say, well, we are putting persons in, on the moon, but we don't have uh, 
policies for tackling um, uh, civil rights problems. So the questioning of legitimacy or a mission becoming uh, losing its legitimacy, it's, it's uh, uh, condemning it to, to die. So involving them from the beginning, it's key here, I think. I can just echo that. That is our experience as well, especially in formulating the mission, because then you get this like really having it be, I think it being understood by citizens to have them in, be included and then you get the, the engagements. Then I think to have them on board, one area that I come to think about is, is the health area where over the last five years, uh, Binova, we have included a lot more patient organizations in the projects that we are developing, so that they are really having the, the perspective of the of the of the people that are suffering from from different kind of illnesses, that they are part in developing the the uh, cure for their diseases because they now know how the the cure is being um, be, being uh, prescribed to 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 them. So I think that has been very has been really a, a new way of opening up, getting much better solutions uh, and more effective solutions. So I think that's, that's very, very exciting. Thank you very much. Now things have started to happen here and we are really uh, getting close to the end, but I will have an, a, one more question to Professor K uh, Pena. How to embed sustainability ideas such as the SDGs in an already existing policies related to innovation. For example, the local productive arrangements. Um, that's first for Mr. Pena. And then I have another question for Mr. Appelqvist. And then I think we have to wrap up. Mr. Pena, please. Yes, that, that's uh, an important question. And I think that is no, no easy answer to that. If we think that currently in Brazil, the mood is not very much uh, attuned to sustainability goals then this becomes a really a challenge. Uh, often there is a perception, a trade-off in public opinion between economic goals and sustainability goals. And I think the key here is to show that achieving sustainable development goals will also help to improve uh, the welfare also from the economic point of view that it will create jobs and it will create uh, opportunities for all. And I think that the local level is, is really, I wouldn't say the most appropriate, but very appropriate for developing sustainability missions. So I think uh, by embedding sustainability in already existing policies is a way to, to do it. Thank you very much, Mr. Pena. And then uh, the last question here for uh, Mr. Appelqvist. How has Sweden managed to successfully integrate sustainability in its policies and become, according to some rankings, the most sustainable country in the world? Well, I think there, there are, of course, like historical reasons for that, taking on the, the ecological challenges quite early in terms of developing policies and things like that. But I think one important aspect of this is, is, I think, really the private sector stakeholders in, in, in Sweden. I think I, I, I have been quite impressed by, the, by how they have embraced the sustainable development goals and how they have understood them as really the I think the I, I've heard someone say that they, these are really the, the ask for from the world to, to stakeholders working with innovations in the future. So this is really about, if you look at the sustainable development goals, you're really looking at the future markets. And I think that's really the, the, the um, approach that the Swedish companies have taken on. So that they really, they, they understand that perhaps this is not the, the demand of today, but it will be the demand in three years or seven years. And then you need to start doing, then you need to start doing the innovation so that you can supply the things that the, the the market will demand in a couple of years. So I think that's really the move away from this trap of seeing a, um, a contradiction between uh, like competitiveness and, and sustainability and then, then make the investments. And innovation, of course, is, is key here, uh, developing new solutions, because a lot of the things that are being asked in the sustainable development goals have not been invented yet. So, um, so, so I think that that's key. I mean, having really companies that have innovation as, as, as part of their DNA 
and, and or the core of their strategies i think that's that's an important answer thank you very much both of you for great uh, answers and also for the participants for great questions my apologies that we don't have time for all the questions sent in uh, we have now passed the schedule for by four minutes and uh, over to you jacob Yes, uh, thank you very much. I will thank the panel and, and all the uh, participants also from the ministries and uh, of course all the attendees which has been listening to this uh, and I hope this has opened up, up for a discussion. We can continue on how we can use this mission-oriented innovation in our further cooperation between the countries. So uh, I will uh, once again thank you everybody and uh, uh, I think we can end the seminar here. Then, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. We now have a twenty-minute break. Oh, actually, it's uh, forty.